Good morning. <clears throat> I'm a little horse. I'm a Shetland pony. You know, I practice that. So bear with me. We're going to be talking about uh, our third aspect of the order of salvation today. And so we're looking at regeneration, regeneration today. You know, the Bible uses a lot of different terms to talk about salvation. It doesn't just use the word saved. And so saved is a good summary of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. But we want to get more flavor out of the understanding of our salvation. And so we're moving kind of from hot dogs to steak. We want to savor every bite or if you're a vegetable person from like celery to any other good vegetable. But we, we want to we wanna really draw out the flavor. What, what is our salvation about? And we'll find that as our knowledge increases about what we know about what God has done, it'll actually give us a good firm foundation for our faith, a, a firmer foundation than our feeling about uh, what we believe and why we believe it. So we're going to be looking at John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, our sermon text for today. John chapter 3, 1 through 8. I'll give you a second to get there. We'll read this together and then let's pray. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you that you are not like the idols of the nations or the idols of our hearts. You bring new life. Where there was only death and silence, wickedness and evil, now there is rejoicing. Eruptions of celebration of new life, buds and blossoms, growth. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do that work among this body today whether it's a a renewal of life for those who are walking and um, struggling in some sense or doubting, would you renew a right spirit within them? And for those who are clinging to death, who are standing in their graves, would you bring them to life? Would you cause them to reach out in faith to Christ Jesus by the work of your Holy Spirit? Father, thank you for your word. Would you be pleased to use it all for your glory? In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, there are some here who need to be born again today. Not just like, you know, turn the leaf over, kind of a a new start, but a whole new life. You need a new birth, and that's what regeneration is all about. Now, sounds like a $10 word, so we should probably unpack it briefly. It comes from the Greek. There's a, there's a fun verb, ganao. You can write that down if you want, ganao. Uh, it, it just simply means to be born, and in John 3, we've got this, you must be born again. Jesus says, Genothe anothen, you must be born again. You can see we've got definitions listed for you in your bulletin insert. Regeneration is the most recent one. That act of God by his spirit, where new life in Christ is implanted in those whom God has chosen and called. 
From our passage, you can see that Nicodemus didn't think about the Spirit working in that way. He thought simply, what am I supposed to do? I'm an old man. Do I go find my mom and crawl back into her womb to get this thing done that Jesus is asking me to do? And obviously, we can see that Jesus is talking about a different type of new birth, a spiritual new birth. So if you're taking notes today, I've got three Points for you. Number one, what is regeneration? We're going to talk about it a little bit more in depth. Number two, what isn't regeneration? What isn't regeneration? And then lastly, the benefits of regeneration. What is regeneration? What isn't regeneration? And then the benefits of regeneration. So you just heard in our passage in John 3, 1 through 8, Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. And then you're immediately confronted with that definition that we read. And what Jesus also uh, brings out in our passage, that the Spirit is the one who's bringing new life. There's a little bit of a contradiction. Nicodemus, you've got to do this thing. Nicodemus, you can't do this thing. This is the work of the Spirit. So theologians, they look at Scripture carefully down through the years, and they've understood uh, and called regeneration a monergistic work of God. That's another fancy $10 word. But it simply means mono and then energy, one person doing the work, and that's God by his Holy Spirit. One party involved in bringing new life. Imagine a baby, full term, it's been kicking, twisting, pressing on mom's bladder for quite a while, and that baby is ready to come out. That baby can't do a thing on its own to be born. The same is true of you in a spiritual sense. You can't do anything to be born again. This is the Spirit's work. It's God's work alone to give you a new heart. Now, this work is done in in correspondence with what we've already seen before. We talked about election. We've talked about calling. Regeneration is that next step. Those whom God, God chooses, those whom God calls, are those whom the Spirit brings new life to. When we think about regeneration and what it is, we want to know that God very often uses his word to bring new life, to bring regeneration. James 1.18 says it this way, of his own will, he, that is God, brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God brought us forth by the word of his truth. So when you think that this Bible is just kind of lifeless and limp, this is what God is pleased to use to bring new life. 1 Peter 1.23, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. So there's a strong correlation between the word and the spirit to bring new life into existence. This does not mean that God can't work beyond the preached word or the studied word or the sung word, but that God often, often uses his holy word, his scripture, to bring about new life through his spirit. Now, back to the baby illustration. I like a nice baby illustration because I get to think about a nice little baby, okay? Nice little cuddly soft baby. And I think we think about that, and this baby is kind of in neutral, just sitting in mom's womb, ready for the kick out, okay? That mom doesn't actually kick, it's a push. But the baby is not just in neutral, in a spiritual sense. When God comes by his spirit to bring new life, Ephesians 2.5 describes our spiritual state not as in neutral, but in reverse. We're going backwards, we're going downwards, we are dead. Ephesians 2.5 says it like this. When we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. So, yeah, you can think about sort of new life, new baby, good metaphor, but it's a little more appropriate as you drive past a cemetery to think about it that way. That's where you were. Think about that. Before being chosen and called, before the Spirit brings new birth, before you have a heart to believe in Jesus, that's you. Powerless, rotten, unable to cling on to hope. The only thing you want to cling to is your sin. But then new birth happens, and and this new life that God brings by his Spirit is aimed in one particular direction. You know, mom and dad's early goals for children are 
survival. That's kind of the number one goal. Let's keep this thing, baby, alive. And God's goal is let's bring this person to faith. There's a direct outcome from regeneration. That person is going to reach out uh, with faith upon Jesus. A regenerate person, someone with new life, they can believe. A, an unregenerate person, someone who does not have a new heart, a new life by the Holy Spirit, cannot believe in Jesus, no matter how hard they might try. Dead people can't reach out a hand, metaphorically, right? And hold, I mean, dead people can't reach out a hand regardless, but metaphorically, they can't reach out a hand and hold on to Jesus. So regeneration precedes faith. It comes before faith. And we want to keep one other thing straight when we think about what is regeneration. What is this act of God by his spirit? Regeneration is not tied to baptism as though baptism causes new life, causes someone to follow Jesus. The church has struggled with this. The church sort of globally has struggled with this, even in history. And there are other denominations, largely Catholicism. They land in a, this camp that says the waters of baptism have a saving effect. They're going to help that person find the Lord. And if we as Baptists believe that were the case, I would give all of you a super soaker and say just go start hitting people with holy water. Because if this is just going to naturally cause new life and then we're going to watch people just faithfully follow the Lord, why not? But we know that life testifies that that is not how uh, infant baptism particularly works. There are some that are sitting here today who have been baptized as infants and you did not come to know the Lord until way down the road. And there are some that we know in our lives that were baptized as infants or babies and they never came to know the Lord. So we don't want to draw a, a direct connection between baptism and regeneration. Yes, there's some seemingly close connections there, but we use Scripture to interpret Scripture. And so we might say, as, as Jesus is speaking uh, to Nicodemus, that there is a washing aspect to new birth, especially if you're an Old Testament Jew like Nicodemus. That Jesus is talking about this new life that's coming. It's, it is as though one is being washed, being uh, uh, made clean. But in no way does baptism cause or bring new life. Baptism is a symbol. We sang about it. We talked about it a little bit already. But baptism is the symbol of what new life uh, has become for us. We have died and risen with Christ by faith. Baptism is a picture of that. So we know now uh, the, the sort of the outcomes and also that that. Uh, regeneration is not tied directly to baptism, but why does regeneration happen? Why would God choose to bring someone new life? What's God's aim? And you're going to hear a little bit more about this in point number two, but rebirth is not so that you can get a do-over, relive your glory years. Something more fundamental has happened. This is rebirth to a particular end that you might know Christ and that you might bring him glory in your life. God is jealous for his glory. God is jealous that people might know his power and his compassion and his love. When God raises the dead to life, what are they going to do? They're going to turn around and they're going to praise God for what he's done. That's why God gives us new hearts, that we might worship him, that he might receive more and more glory, and we get the joy of new life and of showing others his power. I don't think that's how most Christians think about regeneration or new birth or new life. We like to think about second chances. We like to think about New Year's resolutions, the things I'm really committed to changing this year. So this kind of rebirth, this experience to become the best version of ourselves, this is what the culture pitches us day in and day out. And I think it clouds our Christian thinking about what regeneration is. And so I want to get the fog lifted and get us encouraged about what God has done and is doing. So now I want to talk about what regeneration isn't. What regeneration isn't. I think an illustration might, might help here. So there's a 54-year-old steel worker named Mike Kasparak. And the year is 1968. He's laying on a surgical table 
at the University of Stanford Medical Center, and he is about to become the recipient of the first ever human heart transplant. So Mike's health has been declining for about 10 years, and if he doesn't get a new heart within weeks, he's going to be dead. And so he and the medical team and his wife, they make this decision, okay, we're going to do it. We're going to get this new heart. And so he lays down, and the surgery happens. And I'm going to bet that Mike Kasparak had this thought. New heart, new start. New heart, new start. We've known people, probably some of you, have had a life-altering medical condition, emergency, and you sort of get this new burst of energy, a new lease on life, right? People talk about that after their first heart attack. I'm going to do things differently this time. And I'm sure Mike had those thoughts. I'm going to go fly fishing, finally. I'm going to build that deck. I'm going to spend time with the grandkids. The new heart, new start mentality is confronted by Mike's physical limitations. Right after his surgery, 15 days he suffered, and then he died. Not a real good first human heart transplant. And I think the same thing happens to us spiritually. You think, Okay, God, I'm going to take this seriously this time. I'm not going to waste this second chance you're giving me. And then we try to kind of work ourselves into a fever, but then the old persistent sins show up. We crave, we cave, we sin. We start to go, oh, I got to do this again. I got to go to God again. I got to start over again. He gets so frustrated. We got this internal Mike Kasprak. I put myself on the table. I was committed this time. I can't screw this up. I'm not going to waste this new heart. That's how we incorrectly think about the new life that Jesus brings us into. Like Jesus saved you, but you're still in this weird, tense standoff with him. He's like looking around. One more chance, buddy. One more chance. You fail me again, you're out of here, right? He's got you on the spiritual rehab plan for bad Christians. Some of us think that Jesus wipes the slate clean, that Jesus resets the score and now it's time for you to start doing your job. Look what I did. you you got to start putting in some work here. That's not how regeneration works. That's so far from regeneration. There are a couple of sub points to go with point two if you're an outline note taker. Regeneration number one, or A, isn't how you feel about your faith or your feelings at all. Regeneration is not about how you feel about your faith or your feelings at all. Tomorrow morning, you might feel far from God. You might wake up and you, the dust is still thick on your Bible. You yell at your spouse or your kids. You doubt your faith. You might have had a rich devotional time. Maybe it's great. Maybe, maybe you're on top of the world. You're feeling so close to God, but whether you're high or low, you cannot feel your way away from what the Spirit has done. You cannot feel your way away from what the Spirit has done. Number two, regeneration isn't how you perceive your conversion. I think this happens in church culture. We've got the people that grew up in church, the people that I don't remember a time when I didn't know the Lord. The person that accepted Jesus as their Savior when they were five, and then they walked a fairly righteous life by the help of the Spirit. Then you've got the sort of gutter to mountaintop experience that we hear about as well. People come in, and their life was at an end, and and they come to know the Lord. And and I think often the people with the the more, um, in a worldly sense, the more mundane story, the I was five or six or seven when I came to know the Lord, We kind of doubt, is this real faith? I mean, I didn't really have this monumental conversion. I don't even remember the day I made my decision. It's not about how you perceive your conversion. I think whether you are a gutter to mountaintop Christian where you were deep in your sin and the Lord lifted you out or you've been walking with the Lord faithfully since you were young, we all have our doubts. And we all have this wonderful opportunity. The Lord provides us with a wonderful opportunity in Mark 10, 45 particular to say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. It isn't the measure of your faith that saves you. 
Some people try to work themselves up into more and more faith, but it's not the measure of your faith that saves you. It is the object of your faith that saves you. It's your faith resting upon Christ Jesus. And even then, sometimes we doubt. And who is holding us when we doubt? It's Jesus. By his spirit. Pulling us closer, closer, holding us. So regeneration isn't a reset button. You you don't get like three more lives to try the level and beat the boss. That's not what regeneration is. It's not a fresh set of batteries in the remote, right? Same functions, just more life. This is so much more. Regeneration is so much more. You are a new creation. You're a new creation. You don't stop being a new creation. God doesn't turn the light on in your heart and say, "Eh, made a mistake, back off. You are a new creation. The light never goes off. The Holy Spirit is working in you. Understanding the nuts and bolts of our salvation, this order of salvation that we're preaching through, is very, very important here. Because if you start to lay down the foundation of your salvation as your feelings or how you feel about God or how you feel about how you're doing or how you feel about your behavior, you're going to run into serious problems. My faith is often up and down, right? And if I start banking my salvation on whether I'm sinning or I'm not sinning or my emotions, I'm going to run out of steam. And I'm going to get my thoughts tangled up on who's doing the saving. I'm going to get my thoughts tangled up on who's doing the saving. I'm going to feel like it's me most of the time. I am saving myself here. Thanks, God. Thanks for giving me another chance. But I've got to save myself. I've got to pull up my own bootstraps. But you are not part of the process of regeneration. Go back to the definition. Read it. Memorize it. This is an act of God by his spirit to bring new life. Not an act of God by you to bring you new life. It's one of the most freeing aspects of our salvation. God did something and it can't be undone. You you don't get to sneak around and get like a do-over, plead for one more try, and you don't have to, right? God blesses us with the Spirit and he keeps on blessing us. So I, I want to consider now the, the benefits of regeneration. Our third point, the benefits of regeneration. Listen again to what Jesus says to Nicodemus in verse 5. Unless you're born by water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless you're born by water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So we we understand now the Spirit does this work, and we know that baptism is a symbol of new life in Christ. It's not the cause. That's the first part of this verse. But there's so much more to regeneration. There's a new destination for you. Being reborn means that you're now a a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You're, You're now headed to the kingdom of God. You've been allowed entrance. And I think we think about our existence, our physical existence, very simply. I'm living here in Madison. Maybe you're a college student. You're here for a few years. Maybe you've been in Lake County your whole life. Maybe you conceive of yourself bouncing around from place to place with your careers. But brother and sister, you've been reborn into a new spiritual existence. You're in the kingdom of God. And right here, right now, spiritually speaking, you are before the throne of God. You are before the throne of God. And if you don't believe me, read the book of Hebrews. You're not just sitting here. You've got a spiritual existence before the throne of God cheering you on in one sense as as Christ pleads for you, as Christ intercedes for you. There you are when we worship. There you are. Even more than that, the new birth that happens, you get a persistent, powerful, personal God. You get the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. This is God's Holy Spirit who starts a good work and does not 
uh, quit. He brings it to completion. He doesn't just change you once and then say, you're on your own. Figure the rest of this out by yourself. He helps you understand grace. That even when you crave, even when you cave, even when you sin, Jesus doesn't turn his back. He stays with you. And then the Spirit starts to do something crazy. He changes our cravings. Louis Burkhoff says we have a Godward disposition implanted in us. You can't help but strive after the Lord. He starts to change our beliefs and our actions. He points us back toward Jesus again and again. The grace that brought you in keeps you in the kingdom. Now, how do you know that you're born again? Well, just like a baby, you start to grow. So the Bible uses that as a metaphor. The, the Bible also uses you know, a tree or a young, a young plant as a metaphor all throughout Scripture. We look for growth. We look for fruit. We look for maturity. More strange and wonderful things continue to happen. More benefits. You used to love being dead. You used to love being dead. You were all wrapped up in your coffin. Just you and your selfishness. But now you desire life. You desire to be around more living people. Why do you think you keep showing up here on Sunday? You think you're just deciding on your own? I think the Spirit is prompting you every week, and some of you more than just Sunday, to show up to be involved in other Christians' life because you like the aroma of new life. Right? You come in, and, and it's like we're seated at the table of God. We're getting to taste some of it even now before we're with Him. Slowly over time, you start to make decisions that demonstrate the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. That is, I say yes to righteousness, I say no to sin. I say yes to righteousness, I say no to sin. Not perfectly, I didn't say perfectly. That's the sort of reset button mentality that I'm done with this. And I'm going to get it right perfect this time. But we start to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. And that is a gift of the Spirit who continues to work in you. 1 John 3.9 puts it this way. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. It's not that they don't sin. It's they don't make a habitual practice of sinning. Like, I don't care that this monster is living in my life. It's just fine. No one can see it. I pretend that I can't see it. That's not how Christians live. Man, when we sin, we're so confronted by that sin. Oh, it grieves us so much. We have to lay it down. We have to confess it. We have to fight it because God's Spirit won't let you live another way. You start to resemble your Heavenly Father. Every newborn baby re resembles, right, parents, biological parents. Every newborn. Every newborn Christian starts to look more and more like the God who made them. Albeit there's some degrees, certainly, and some limitations. There's some differences but you're going to start looking like your father. Now, I have to say there's some mystery here. We're going to talk about it more next week because the Spirit blows where it wishes. We read that in verse 8. And this is God's sovereign solo action. But that does not reduce man's responsive obligatory action. The Spirit blows, and, and if I'm being acted upon by the Holy Spirit, I don't really have a choice. I'm going to choose Jesus. Your free will was so corrupt before new birth that you only wanted to choose death. Now, with the Holy Spirit, after new birth, not only can we choose life, but we want to. That's the thing you want. How great and glorious is the gift of Jesus. That's what you want now. And that's why Jesus can tell Nicodemus, you must be born Again, here's where our, sort of our contradiction comes into view. God's going to give Nicodemus a heart to believe in Jesus. God's going to change him so that he no longer just desires himself and more sin and more death. He's going to give him a heart that reaches out in faith to Jesus. I think some of you don't think that you can be born again. I think some of you think that you're too far gone. You're too rotten, you're too wicked, you're too ashamed. When God looks at you, he's just disappointed. He's done with you. Why, you're done with yourself. Why, why would he want to, you know, welcome you in? 
God wouldn't look at you. He wouldn't love you. He wouldn't transform you. And I, I don't believe that that's the case. I don't believe Scripture says that that's the case. I want you to hear this from the prophet Ezekiel. He's called to prophesy life over the dead bones of Israel. And it's a scene that powerfully sets forth what God intends to do in your life by his spirit. He doesn't do this for people who have cleaned themselves up. He doesn't do it for people who promise they're going to try harder this time. The spirit brings life to those who are dead. There are no signs of life. I don't know if any of you have ever been uh, in a hospital room with a loved one who's passed away, but there is an audible sign, right, an audible sound when there's no life. There's a, a flat line, right? Beep, beep, beep. You're dead, 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 dead. No coming back. That is who Ezekiel is called to prophesy over. So listen to this from Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. There is no life in this valley. It is barren. There's no plants. There's no people walking around. Ezekiel's just seen a lot of very dry bones. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you. And you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. Right, we're going from the flat line, death, silence, to this sound of life coming Verse 7, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man. Say to, uh, say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. I love this. This is what we say sometimes, don't we? Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. If that's you today, that's how you think your life is going, that God is done with you, look at him bringing new life by his spirit. Verse 12, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. You look back at your life and you see one dark page after another. You see regret stacked on top of regret. Ugly, vicious, terrible sin. And your bones are so dry. You just hear the wind whistling. Even sitting here now, some of you feel like you're walking dead. You're chained to your grave. And some of you are. Your conscience gnaws at you. It, it tells you, Look at all these dead ends that you've chosen. Oh, you failure. Oh, you failure. All the hurt, all the debris of sin. And then we numb our nagging conscience away with more sin, more deceit. And the flesh just continues to rot. And so you try and give yourself a new heart. This is the last time. This is the last time I'm doing this thing. After this, I'm, I'm starting fresh. I'm starting fresh. God's not done with me. Or maybe you figure you are too far gone and everyone has their vices. 
deep down, you want to be better. You want to be free from guilt and sin. But you do not have what it takes on your own. You don't have what it takes on your own. That's the offense of the gospel that given a choice, you would just keep choosing death. You want these dry bones. But God brings new life to the dead. God did something about this choice we kept making. He sent his own son to be crushed, to be vilified, tortured by the weight of all of your sin. Jesus willingly chose death to bring life, right? He goes to the grave to bring you up out of it. So do not put confidence in yourself. Trust in Jesus. Trust that if God has set you apart from the beginning of time, from the foundations of the world, right? If God has called you here today, then your dead bones, your sin, your scars, your brokenness, they can do nothing to stop God. He has the power to raise up new life through faith in Christ Jesus. When you're reborn by the Spirit, you're going to start to recognize this uh, growing faith, and you're going to feel like a newborn. You're going to feel messy. You're going to feel dependent. You're going to feel like you're crying and whining a lot, and it's going to be really hard. Yes and amen. God is pleased to have borne you, weak and feeble. And he intends to help you grow. So if you're skeptical of your own faith, wondering if you're even a Christian today, know that believing in Jesus right now, that's confirmation of regeneration. Believing in Jesus is confirmation of regeneration. And it's not just a one-time thing. It's an ongoing belief. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I tell you, dead folks do not believe in Jesus. But he makes us alive that we can and that we will. So if you're on the fence today, if you're looking back at the grave, I'm praying that you would come to life through faith in Jesus. Let me pray to that end. Let's pray together. Father God, what an image. Ezekiel 37 and the dry bones. And I pray for those who are listening today, particularly who are still looking for signs of life and trying to will themselves out of their sin, out of their misery, out of their guilt, that they would stop, that they would give up, that they would say, oh, my Lord, these are just dry bones. I have nothing to offer. And that they would know the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon them and bring them new life. Give them the words to say. The cry of salvation is not an elaborate one. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And just like that, new life comes into dead bones. Sinews and skin and flesh and breath. And many are added to the kingdom. Father, would you be pleased to do that work by your spirit today? Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the perfect atoning sacrifice of Christ Jesus. For his penalty paying, dying for our sins, and for his righteousness, making us right before you. But we treasure him all the more. Spirit, help us to cling on to Christ. Help us to follow after him as he leads us toward home. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we